button to kick us off and to introduce the webinar. So Jan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Hans, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone, from, from wherever you're dialing into this webinar. It's a very timely event, and the topic um, is, is, is very important in the current discussion around decarbonizing the energy system. And I've worked on energy efficiency and heating for more than a decade now, but I cannot remember a time when there have been almost daily reports in major newspapers, on the radio and TV on heating. Uh, we all saw the new pledges made by uh, some of the major economies last week, uh, and those mean that it's ever more important that we reduce emissions from heating um, as fast as we can. I will make a very brief introduction before I open the floor to our three excellent speakers, each of who will present one example of an integrated solution to decarbonize heating from a different country and in a slightly different way. Um, and then uh, we have a bit of a Q&A session at the end. There has been a great deal of focus on electricity system decarbonization over the past decade in Europe, but also outside of Europe, and great progress uh, has been made. Um, however, and that is really important, um, half of Europe's energy use is actually for heating, mainly buildings, uh, and this is quite similar at the global level. And more of three quarters of that energy is currently still from fossil fuels. So we have a long way to go and need to accelerate quite rapidly. It is now widely accepted uh, that a shift from combusting fossil fuels to electrification, either through individual heat pumps or district heating systems coupled with electrification is a key feature of decarbonizing heat, complemented by other low carbon heating sources. And this means in turn that the electricity system and the building sector will increasingly converge with significant load growth due to the electrification of heating. At the same time, we will see more renewables that are variable, such as solar and wind, which in turn means that we need to integrate both the demand and the supply side a lot more. My colleague Mike Hogan often says that in the past we used to schedule supply to meet demand. And in the future, we increasingly will have to schedule demand to meet supply. And luckily, heating, I believe, can perform this role very well. And we hear more about that um, from the speakers. So on a daily basis, it is already well possible to run heat pumps flexibly. For example, you may think of preheating homes overnight when the wind is usually stronger. That is one way of taking advantage of the thermal storage capacity of buildings or ramping down heat demand during peak hours which is something I do in my own home on a regular basis uh, to take advantage of cheaper tariffs. And there are examples where this has been tested in Denmark, Germany and Scotland and elsewhere. And Laura will speak about this a little bit more in her presentation later on. As we get to much higher shares of buildings using electricity for heating, the question of course is not just daily balancing, but seasonal balancing. You know, what about the two weeks of a cold spell where the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, but there's a high demand for heat. And this is where district heating is so interesting. And Christian will tell us more about this in his presentation uh, later on. And in our research, we found multiple projects already underway where large scale thermal storage is being used in district heating systems to take advantage of heat excess during weeks and months way before the heating period and store it extracted later on. Another option, of course, is the use of hydrogen for balancing the system in a similar way. And Stefan will talk about hydrogen based CHP plants in particular that could be connected to a district heating system, for example. So without further ado, I now hand over to our first speaker, Christian van Mark Kalschavert. I hope I have uh, pronounced that properly, Christian, from the Danish Energy Association. Um, over to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Jan. It was almost correct, um, and I'm not offended. Um, my name is, is Christian van Marshall Kivert, and I'm working at the Association of uh, Danish Energy Utilities, um, producers, producers of renewable energy, district heating, and also distribution companies in Denmark. Um, Denmark, as you know, is a very small country, and, and in, in many ways, we are neglectable in a global context, but I hope that what I can provide here today are some some experiences and examples that can also in, inspire and be be useful in in, in a wider context outside um, our country. Um, 
we have for for many years uh, been working hard to to reduce our emissions and to phase out fossil fuels and what you see in the left hand side of this uh, slide is the graph of our total net emissions from 1990 and until today and then a forecast until 2030 and what you see is that the reductions have uh, been quite significant and that they will also continue until 2030 but we also have a 70% reduction target in 2030 and there still is a quite significant gap between that target, uh, the blue part of the graph, and, and where we expect to be in the forecast. So a lot more action is, is needed in order to fill that target. Um, if we zoom into the electricity and district heating uh, emissions in Denmark, that's what you see on in the right hand side. Um, oh, I don't know what happened there. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Is, is it you, Hans, or who's controlling the, the slides? OK, now we're back. Um, we see that the emissions from the electricity and district heating sector has um, decreased quite significantly. And this sector has changed from being a huge part of the problem, one of the major emitters, to becoming a key part of the solution. Uh, in 2030, we expect the emissions from this sector to be very close to zero. And we also expect that uh, electrification will help a lot of other sectors um, reduce their emissions. That's direct electrification of, of heating and transport, but also indirect um, through electrofuels, uh, for example, in uh, the maritime industry and for uh, uh, trucks and so on. But this, this, uh, this change will also, also change the way we run our energy system. And, and let, as Jan said in his introduction, we will be dealing with um, a completely new way of looking at power production and our demand. And we will have a very difficult task in, in balancing this green electricity system. This graph here um, shows how our uh, power consumption will increase. That's the green graph. And actually, and, and a very recent forecast um, presented this week, week will uh, predict an even steeper increase in the band than, than you see here because of the electrification of, for example, transportation and heating. Uh, luckily, we have very strong uh, interconnectors uh, helping us uh, so we can import and export um, with our neighboring country, countries. But flexible uh, and price sensitive demand is, is also needed. Just to give you an example, um, this slide shows a lot of information, so but don't be too confused. I will talk you through it. If we start by, by the red graph, it shows the demand profile. And each of these red mountains that you see is, is one day. So that's the demand profile for one day. And in total, you see seven days in this, in this graph. And what you also see is the production from different uh, technologies in Denmark. The dark blue one, one is wind power and the yellow is solar power. And you see that they go up and down quite rapidly. And from one day here where you have almost zero production from wind turbines, the very next day you have more than 100% of your demand covered by, by wind. So, so this is, uh, and this is the picture from, from last year in the, in the future that will, that difference will be even more dramatic as the share of wind and solar increases. Um, and as I said, import and export is what ensures the balance in the system today. The difference between the grid graph and the aggregated production is, is here imported and what is, and here where the production is exceeding the demand, it's a, it's a net export to our neighboring countries. And we've been very lucky to have some neighbors with, um, with a lot of hydropower that has served as kind of a battery or, or storage for us. And, it's a, a mutual beneficial cooperation because we it allows us to, to balance our system in Denmark. And at the same time, 
the hyperpower companies, they can sell electricity to us, to, to us when the prices are high. That's the green graph. And they can import from us when the prices are, are low. But, but again, uh, RE shares are increasing and not also only in Denmark, also in our neighboring countries. So where in the future we could export excess wind power, we will maybe be in a situation very soon where our neighboring countries will also have excess wind power in the same situation. So the demand uh, flexibility becomes more and more important. And what I will tell you a bit about today is how district heating can be an important part of that solution. So first I'll give you a little bit of background uh, info on district heating in Denmark. It's a very popular form of heating. Um, 64% of Danish households are heated with district heating and a lot of areas that are today heated with the individual gas boilers are in the process of being converted to either district heating or individual heat pumps. Um, historically, the, the district heating systems have been primarily being supplied with heat from combined heat and power plants. So either gas or coal and historically, but in recent years also more and more biomass fired heat and power plants. But now a lot of this production is converted to, to heat pumps and, and heat only boilers. Um, and these heat only boilers can be either electric or biomass fired. So, the, so this is changing district heating companies from being producers of both power and, and heat to be consumers of electricity in order to produce their heat. Um, and heat storage has always been an integrated part of the system to enable an optimal operation of the CHP plants because they, they wanted to be able to, to run their uh, CHP plant when the electricity prices are high and then store some heat for, for maybe the nighttime when electricity prices are, are lower. So almost all district heating companies in Denmark will have some kind of heat storage integrated into their system. But um, as a consequence of this increasing RE share, uh, the economic value of heat storage is increasing. And now we also see investments in, in storage capacity um, at, a, at a much larger scale. And just to show you how, how can you store uh, heating, the at the left-hand side, you see this basically a big thermo bottle, which almost all district heating companies in Denmark have as a part of their system where they can store maybe enough um, heat to, to cover one night's consumption of heat. So that's basically a storage that for, for one day or to, to, to produce during the day and use during the night. But in many, in many places, we've also had uh, large um, solar heat facilities and they have built um, larger storage uh, capacities in order to make seasonal storage. And that's, the, as a, that's an example of that you see here in, in the mid picture where you actually have a big, basically it's, it's a big hole in the ground with an insulated lid where you can store uh, hot water for a, for a long time. But these large uh, scale storage systems are now also um, being built um, as a, as a tool to, or as an investment in flexibility, not as a seasonal storage. The facility on this picture is, is on its way. And when it's, uh, it has uh, been finalized, it will be able to store heating corresponding to an annual demand of 2,500 households. Um, so it's it's rather big, and it's it's the intention that this facility should be used in collection in connection with both heat heat pumps and surplus heat from from industries and some electric boilers, and that they will use this facility to to optimize their um, the way they run their entire system. Um, and to the to the right side, I also write that there's some thermal capacity in buildings. And I think that's also relevant to, to remember because uh, that's, and I think that's also what Jan uh, was talking about in his introduction, that there's actually a lot to, to gain from using this thermal capacity in buildings. And I know that in, in Finland, they have been experimenting with using artificial intelligence and using that to control the demand in buildings. And they showed that this could, 
reduce the need for expensive peak capacity quite significantly. Um, and I think this the capacity in the buildings is also uh, important to have here. To, just to note that um, this storage option is not only available in district heating systems. It can also be, be done for individual uh, heat pumps if they are operated in, in an intelligent way. When, when these markets are developing, they are also becoming more and more complex. Um, I think previously it was, it was quite simple. You have had the spot price and you, you knew that when the spot price uh, went up, you should lower your consumption and increase your production and vice versa. Uh, but I think they are becoming more and more products and, and we, it's not, maybe it's not so much the spot price that's important. It's the real economic value is in the ancillary services. And uh, you also see a more differentiated tariffs for using the uh, distribution and transmission grid. So how to, to optimize your uh, production and consumption of electricity as a district heating company becomes more and more complex. And some of the larger companies, they have the, the ability to, to handle this complexity. But in many cases, we are talking, at least in Denmark, about small companies that does not have the um, specialization to, to, to handle that. And that increases the role of aggregators because aggregators can then help smaller companies optimize their um, production and consumption. And, and I think again, for individual heat pumps, that's the same. Uh, you could imagine in, in the future that aggregators could get quite a, a significant business from being able to control individual heat pumps around the country. And my last slide here is um, a bit about the regulatory framework, because how do we get these things to work and how do we um, yeah, make this uh, potential available? And I think just a few words on, on what, how the system works in Denmark is that quite recently, the electricity tax for heating purposes has been reduced to the EM minimum charge. And that has really kicked off the investments in, in heat pumps and electric boilers, both in the district um, heating companies, but also for heat pumps for individual households. And on top of that, um, those houses that are today heated with individual gas boilers, they, have, uh, they can receive a quite significant subsidy if they convert to either to an individual heat pump or to the district heat, to a district heating system, and in the latter case, the, the subsidy is given to the to the district heating company uh, if they expand into new areas. Um, but I think district heating is also um, expensive; it's capital intensive, and it requires a very long lifetime in order to to earn back those huge investment investments. So it's also important to to keep an eye on that and not build district heating everywhere because uh, it's it requires a quite densely populated area in order to be an econo economic attractable solution. Um, and in order to ensure that the regulation in Denmark is uh, requiring that you, the district heating projects can demonstrate that they are cheaper than individual heat pumps in order to be approved by the municipality. So that's a quite important part of the Danish regulation. And other than that, I think it's quite important to, to, to let the price signals uh, from the electricity side kick through. Um, and that's the spot price, it's the prices on ancillary services. And in Den Denmark, we also have something, I think it's uh, rather unique to Denmark, we call it special regulation, but that's some products with a very huge value for, um, for large electricity consumers that can be, be flexible in, in their demand. Um, and I think it, it's important to, to think of this not only as flexibility as a solution to, um, to the, uh, balance uh, production and demand, it's also a way to um, use the, the grid in the, in the most optimal way, because uh, with an increased electrification, we also uh, foresee quite 
significant investments needed in the distribution and in the uh, transmission system. Uh, but if you are able to, to postpone your uh, demand for electricity uh, to, to hours where the distribution and transmission grid is not under heavy pressure, that might also uh, save some significant costs. So, so the distribution tariffs will also incentivize consumers to, to, to place their consumption where in, in hours where the grid is not so under heavy pressure. And so that's both the distribution tariff, but also connection charges uh, should be, uh, be reduced if you, if you are able to, to reduce your load when asked for. And, and my last bullet here is something that I, I mentioned a bit before that today in Denmark, we have many small consumer owned or municipal uh, owned district heating companies. And, and my question here is a, a bit to, to ourselves here in Denmark, if it's, if a consolidation and a more, more commercial ownership of the production units is needed in order to harvest the full flexibility potential. I think that's something that remains to, to be seen, um, whether this, these market opportunities that are quite significant, if they um, are also translated into a more uh, flexible demand. I, I hope so, but I think we will also uh, need to see some, some uh, new, agents uh, working in this business in order to, to harvest the full potential. I, I think those were, were the words from my side and thanks for your attention so far and I'll stay on for, for questions in the end. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Glover from Delta EE. Um, so thanks, Christian, for a great presentation. And just moving on to a more specific example of how um, heating can be used to help balance the electricity network. So the 4D heat project I'm going to talk about today covers a number of different areas. Uh, we've got heating, we've got winds, we've got electricity networks, both the ESO kind of, uh, transmission level and a distribution level as well. The main topic is how we can use residential heating to reduce some of the wind constraints that we have in Scotland. This is a joint innovation project funded by SSEN, so a distribution network operator based in Scotland, and the UK electricity system operator, National Grid ESO. And we delivered it alongside our partners, Everose and Passive Systems, who helped with the analysis. Okay, so. As I mentioned, um, wind curtailment is, is quite a big issue in the UK energy system at the moment. We have an abundance of onshore wind power in Scotland, um, about 8.4 gigawatts of installed capacity overall. And we've got quite a limited transmission network um, to move this power down from Scotland, where it's generated, to England and Wales, where we have most of our, our demand centres. At present, these constraint costs are in the order of about 500 million pounds per year, and it's expected to get far more significant over the next decade as wind deployment is going to rapidly outpace how quickly we can re reinforce the transmission network. So we're looking at different options basically across across the system of ways that we can reduce this, this wind curtailment. One of these options is incentivizing electric residential heating in Scotland to turn up at times where we have these wind constraints. So this includes storage heaters, immersion hot water tanks and heat pumps predominantly. Sadly, uh, in the UK, we're lacking in the district heating uh, systems that you see in Denmark. So we're looking at very much a household level solution here. And the idea behind 4D is that we can hopefully deliver savings to the end consumer and reduce their bills, as well as protecting the distribution network and helping the ESO save on their constraint costs. There should also be some carbon benefits out of this as well. Um, so by avoiding curtailment of that wind, we can use that renewable generation um, instead of fossil fuel power generation. Um, just click on. In terms of how we did this study, this was purely a desk-based research study, um, so no demonstration at this stage, um, but we used a range of different technical and techno-economic modeling techniques. Alongside this, we carried out a range of qualitative research as well, looking at the different routes to market um, for this sort of solution, as well as the customer attitudes towards residential demand response. 
the outputs, the main question was how much of a difference can we make? It's a big problem. Um, is, is this solution one that's worth taking forwards? We also looked at a cost benefit analysis. So financially, what are the savings like at a whole system level? And what are the routes to market to taking this forward? There were three main scenarios that were covered as part of the analysis. So the first was looking purely at what the difference was in uh, heating costs for, for residents by putting in smart controls that could allow them to optimize and make uh, more efficient use of their heating systems to reduce their bills. The next scenario was looking at direct financial incentives. So at times of wind curtailment, can the ESO pay these, these residential homes to turn up their heating systems and make use of that generation? And the third area we looked at was dynamic term of use tariffs. So tariffs which change on a half hourly basis to reflect the wholesale electricity price um, and the variable distribution use of system charges as well that, that we can see in the UK. Um, these tariffs could provide a really strong signal for households to modify their heating loads in response to what's actually going on the grid because there's generally a very high correlation between renewable output um, and low prices, so a good time to, to be using your heating. We looked at two different timeframes for this as well. So 2020 was what's happening um, in, in the system today and also 2030. So in the 2030 scenario, we were looking at improved levels of insulation and different heat demands compared to what we see today, uh, higher levels of electrification of, of our heating systems. And by 2030, we also expect to see far higher levels of wind curtailment as well. So a separate wind curtailment profile was used for this scenario, which was provided to us by National Grid ESO. How we went about the modeling? Well, there were a lot of different inputs that needed to be taken into account. So you can see a few of them in blue around this diagram. So firstly, we needed to know what our housing stock was like. We have quite a range of different types of houses, each with different heat requirements and occupancy profiles. Um, so analysis of, of what that was like across the Scotland study area was really important. And this allowed us to work out what the space heating and hot water demand profiles were for each of the different types of homes that we were studying. We also had data from the ESO on what the predicted curtailed wind energy for Scotland, well, Scotland England boundary is likely to be, and information from our DNO SSEN on what the headroom in their network is. It was a really core part of the analysis that we didn't exceed what, what the low voltage feeders could actually handle. We also looked at different tariff profiles, um, so both the dynamic time of use tariff and a flat electricity price as well. Um, and what payments we might be able to expect the ESO to, to pay customers to incentivize them to uh, increase their heating, heating demand. This all fed into a nice big model in the middle, um, which made decisions on how many homes we could um, turn up the heating in on a given day um, to match what the curtailment profile was that we were expecting to see. We did this on a daily basis, um, looking at exactly what demand we were seeing on the low voltage feeders on each day of the year um, to make sure that we didn't exceed what, what that low voltage network could actually take. The output of this allowed us to calculate uh, how much absorbed uh, curtailed wind energy we had and from that what the different costs were both to the households and to the whole system as well, which fed into our cost benefit analysis. There are a few main components of the, the cost benefit analysis, so different things that we took into account. The first of these was what the voided cost of that wind curtailment was. So at the moment, the ESO pays a lot to these wind farms to get them to turn off. Um, and there's also environmental benefits as well. So we have the ESO savings. Some of these will be shared with the households. So we have some payments going to the households as part of the, those direct incentives. Um, and we have the environmental benefits of CO2 and NOx savings as well. 
We also have the benefits that smart controls by themselves can, can give to homeowners, both through operational savings and through shaping their demand to match tariffs, um, as Jan suggested at the start. Um, but also this has a bit of a cost associated with them. So we made sure we took that into account, both as the upfront capital costs, but also the ongoing operational cost of, of optimizing these houses as well, you know, assuming that there would be an aggregator involved in this process. So moving on to our findings, it was really positive. Um, and we were actually quite surprised at how positive some of these scenarios came out as. So for our 2030 scenario, which is what I'll focus on in, in the interest of time, um, we saw reductions in wind curtailment across all of the different scenarios that we considered, both with just the smart controls alone, which was a very coincidental saving that through optimizing these houses to reduce the cost for the household, we also coincidentally um, timed some of the demand to match when just wind curtailment was happening. Through explicit incentivization by the ESO, we could almost double that, that saving. Um, but more interestingly, and probably the most uh, impactful um, finding that we saw here was that through incentivizing dynamic time of use tariffs um, and massively improving the number of customers that are on this sort of tariff, we could reduce the wind uh, curtailment in Scotland on a very cost effective basis. The ESO doesn't need to pay out direct uh, payments to make this happen. The households are making significant savings um, just through shaping their demand to match this tariff. Um, and this resulted in, in significant carbon savings as well. So that was a really interesting scenario for us. When we combined this scenario with an explicit ESO incentive as well, um, we were getting savings of about 500 gigawatt hours of wind curtailment um, being avoided, which equ equated to about 320, I think, ish um, million pounds uh, in our 10 year MPV that we had from our cost benefit analysis. So really, really positive. Um, and yeah, we were actually quite surprised uh, at how much this came out as. Um, for reference, in terms of the, the benefits of, of those savings, for a typical household, uh, some of these households were saving up to 18% on their annual energy bill compared to what they are without um, these smart controls and incentives. And just for that dynamic time of use tariff scenario alone, we were seeing savings in the order of 12 to 15%. In terms of conclusions for this, um, in our 2020 scenario, we were able to reduce wind curtailment by 17%. Um, and by 2030, this had actually reduced to 9%, but that's because the amount of wind curtailment is, is massively increasing over this time, whereas the amount of heating is not to the same extent. We managed to save 213 gig gigatons of CO2 by 2030. And through the smart controls improved customer comfort levels as well, which is a really key, key output. Um, so yeah, all three of the different scenarios we looked at were yielding significant savings, but the combination of all of them was definitely the preferred approach. So smart controls was underpinning both of the other two. And one of our key recommendations uh, for our funding partners was to uh, increase the rollout of, of these different types of control systems. In very recent news, um, there's a project called Energy Cloud and Island that I really wanted to do a shout out for in this presentation. Here, they're, they're facing similar challenges to what we're seeing in the UK with high levels of renewable containment, um, with over 50 million pounds worth of, of energy wasted in 2019 alone. Um, this consortium is a social enterprise, it's a non-for-profit, which includes all the main stakeholders that basically need to be involved in making change happen. They aim to capture some of the surplus renewable energy and distribute it to, to the citizen, citizens in Ireland who are living in fuel poverty. Um, so as part of this consortium, there's some of the, the major social housing landlords involved. We also have some of the big wind developers involved um, and the network operators as well. Houses are gonna be fitted with uh, smart heating control devices, which will activate for when there is renewable energy being curtailed in the system and they're trialing this at the moment. So really exciting news um, from Energy Clouds and it'd be great to see this rolled out more broadly uh, across Europe um, and potentially even further afield. They're in early stages, but um, 
it seems to be going really well and there's very high levels of buy-in across all of these different parties to make this work. So good carbon benefits and good social benefits as well. For further information on everything I've covered, there is a publicly available report so you can dig into all of the detail um, and I think that's going to be shared as part of the materials at the end as well. Thank you very much and as Christian said, I will also be around to take questions at the end. So I hope it works now. Yeah, um, good afternoon also from my side. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot um, yeah, for giving the opportunity to, to speak here in this uh, very interesting and uh, important uh, seminar. Um, yeah, like it was already said at the beginning, um, uh, I will uh, tell you something about hydrogen and um, yeah, how CHP fits into the place. So my name is Stefan Liesner. Um, I work for the company 2G Energy. Uh, we are one of the leading manufacturers of a CHP plant. Um, yeah, we're doing this job now for 25 years and have installed yeah, roughly 7,000 uh, CHPs around the world. And um, yeah, most of them, um, or or we grew out of the German biogas market and also natural gas uh, came on board, let's say roughly 15 years ago. Um, and already 10 years ago, also hydrogen already. And uh, we already did our first hydrogen CHP installation uh, back in 2014 at Berlin Airport in Germany. Um, but at that time, interestingly, nobody was really interested in that. Um, so uh, compared to nowadays publicity, so any any press release we're doing on hydrogen, uh, this increases more or less directly our our um, our share price, which is uh, absolutely uh, crazy. So um, for us, it's uh, the main future topic. Um, so and since we have a um, product range between 20 kW and um, and 4 megawatt, um, so it was already mentioned before that um, the yeah, CHP they fed uh, district heating grids, um, but we have also with our small scale CHPs we directly are connected to small hotels or to any any homes or whatever or, or um, yeah, homes with more flats or whatever um, or small hospitals or whatever. So um, due to our big portfolio we cover a lot of different um, applications. Um, before I move into this um, yeah, CHP technology in itself, um, I'd like to do also recap. And I think uh, this, um, this uh, slide was more or less already discussed before or indirectly mentioned by everybody. Uh, before of, of the former speakers. So I think um, everybody does agree when you see on the, uh, when you have a look on the top side, on the left hand side, um, that the main share of the future energy, uh, energy supply will be done by uh, wind and solar. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, we also all agree on that, that even if we double or, um, or have, a, I don't know, four, five, six times uh, the amount of wind energy and solar energy, we won't be able to meet the electricity or heat demand in these, um, yeah, in these dark periods. Um, I mean, we have battery storages, so what you can see here in the middle. And um, I mean, in, in mobility, um, I mean, when you see the, uh, the sales figures of all the big uh, European car manufacturers, I mean, that's the core topic for them. Um, so uh, the electrification of mobility, and this is more or less um, yeah, also common sense. But we also all know that um, yeah, we, we cannot have a battery as a, uh, as a long-term storage or as a seasonal storage. And that's where hydrogen comes into place. So um, that we can make use of the excess power of renewable sources um, and um, yeah, produce by an electrolyzer hydrogen out of it and then um, use this, um, this hydrogen. And I think this step is very crucial um, to, yeah, let's say, to, to, uh, to see the big role or the big chance of CHP technology. I mean, like uh, Christian from Denmark said, CHP is a very established technology. And um, I mean, it is in place for, I don't know, almost 100 years. Um, and uh, it's a very experienced uh, technology. And as I said, that's, uh, that's the real, uh, that's a big, big chance. I mean, when we have done our first installations based on biogas back in 1995 or 1998, I mean, uh, we uh, installed them or we, we projected them uh, to run 8,000, 8,000 hours uh, or 8,500 hours a year. So 100% load over the year. 
And this is clear, this is absolutely not innovative and this is not flexible, we don't want to do that. So uh, we want to, let's say, to um, yeah, establish our product as a kind of backbone in the future en energy mix. Um, so let's say a flexible possibility um, also when it comes later to hydrogen. Um, I mean, hydrogen is still or will always be a quite expensive um, uh, source. Um, but when we have to use hydrogen, then in a very efficient manner. And CHP technology uh, with the combination of heat and wind, uh, heat and uh, uh, heat and electricity, sorry, um, has a very high efficiency in itself. Um, and so uh, that's why it's, uh, let's say, very, very important uh, to have a look at this um, yeah, re-electrification and reheating uh, in the CHP. Um, also, I was mentioning the flexibility. Um, I mean, there are lots of uh, yeah, lots of different strategies on a national level, on a European level. There's this Clean European Hydrogen Alliance, for example, but nobody really knows when is hydrogen available. So is it in 10 years, in five years, in 15 years? Will it be green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen? Do we have to buy hydrogen from, from other countries or from, from other continents? So, um, and even nowadays, the CHP can be run, yeah. As, uh, as always on uh, natural gas or biogas, for example, but also we can use increased, uh, an increasing share of hydrogen or already 100% hydrogen. So it is already now very, very flexible. But um, I don't know how many of you have ever, let's say, um, went deeper in the technology of a CHP plant. So what does it mean? Just very briefly, I don't want to, want to go into too much details. So a natural gas CHP is a yeah, normal combustion with a turbocharger, with a cooler. And um, the air, gas air mixture is, is, being, um, uh, is being mixed in a gas mixer. This doesn't take place in a hydrogen CHP. There, you only compress and cool down the air, and the hydrogen, due to its uh, physical um, uh, physical characteristics, is being added only very close in front of the combustion chamber. So you can see this um, uh, how it how it works and you know, how it looks like in real life. So you have this um, yeah we call them gas injection valves, very special material in, uh, in order to cope with the physical um, characteristics of this of this hydrogen. Um, so from, uh, of course, it is engineering, but it's uh, only very moderate uh, engineering, let's say. So the difficulties between a natural gas CHP and a hydrogen CHP are not, uh, not that big. And also, I was mentioning the flexibility uh, several times already. A big chance is that uh, with the CHP plant, you can react on yeah, the let's say further developments of, of, the, um, of the European, of the global energy world and the development of the hydrogen uh, availability. So this, for example, was being, uh, this, this project is in South of Germany and it was um, elected as CHP of the year. So where you have a combination on the right hand side, the regular gas mixer for natural gas and on the top also hydrogen, um, this hydrogen rail. So we have a combination. So with an increasing um, or year by year, the amount of available hydrogen increases here at this project. And so the amount um, of hours where the, um, uh, where the system runs on hydrogen is continuously increasing. And we um, have uh, our, our um, uh, our CHPs designed in a way that up to 40% they can run, um, yeah, each natural gas CHP can run uh, with a 40% share of hydrogen. And above that, we have this, um, this hydrogen um, execution. Also very important point, um, uh, of course, everybody wants to avoid stranded investments. And um, especially in Europe or also in Germany, um, there are already nowadays customers who say, okay, I want, I want to be climate neutral, or at least I want to improve my, my energy uh, efficiency. I want to invest in a CHP, but is it really sustainable? So each natural gas CHP, which has been installed today, can be retrofitted for the use of hydrogen or with the use of hydrogen tomorrow. So that's why we always say today, natural gas, tomorrow hydrogen. You don't have any stranded investment with the CHP. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the, the question of costs will come. Uh, so uh, I, can, I can say that in advance, at around 15% of the initial invest um, you can add, and then you can make a hydrogen CHP out of a natural gas CHP. So it only depends on the availability of hydrogen. 
those are yeah some example projects we have already installed. So for us, it's not only a case study anymore. We have real projects and business cases. There's one in Berlin um, uh, I was mentioning in 2014. Then there's the one in South of Germany, um, quite famous. Then we have even one in Dubai together with uh, Siemens in combination with a large PV field. Uh, we have one in the northeast of Germany in Rostock, um, one in Esslingen, which is currently being, um, uh, being commissioned, then one in the UK, uh, Orkney Airport, uh, which is in Scotland in the very north. Uh, and quite interesting, I, I was mentioning the 8,000 hours a year or 8,500. Um, this one is even only operated two hours a day. So um, you can see that it's, it's below 1,000 hours a year. So uh, the whole business case of a CHP um, changes currently. Here, I don't want to elaborate too much on that and everybody's getting the, uh, the, um, the slides uh, afterwards anyway. So that's a typical, let's say, project we are currently doing, such as an Essling, for example, so where the CHP is only part of an entire solution. So there's yeah, a big uh, big entity of a university, you have several residential buildings, you have a local solar wind part, you have an electrolyzer, a small CHP storage. Part of it is even uh, fed of a storage in the natural gas grid in order to make the gas grid greener. Um, you, uh, you have a heating grid for the uh, university, the residential building. So the, um, yeah, the heat out of the natural uh, hydrogen driven CHP uh, supplies the building at the university. You have also this combination with a heat pump, you have the battery storage. So uh, that's a very, very innovative project. And um, yeah, we think uh, that this is a concept, especially for, for dense populated areas for big cities, um, which could work also in the future. So just um, yeah, a short summary of the product, product range, as already said, for us, it's not a case study anymore. Um, for us, it's real life, it's real business, and uh, we have four cylinders, uh, four cylinder engines, six cylinder engines, eight and 12 cylinder en uh, engines. So if uh, anybody is interested, or if we if we, we get an order of, I don't know how many CHPs uh, tomorrow, then it's absolutely no problem. Uh, there is no further R&D work, uh, which has to be done. So just a short summary, maybe uh, CHP systems are part of the renewable energy storage solution in order to re-electrify the wind and solar energy stored in the gas system in a highly efficient manner. Uh, CHP systems are the natural partner technology for PV systems due to the complementary mode of operation. And they're system relevant and can cover the residual load highly efficient as required. Thanks a lot. And uh, I think now I hand over uh, back to Hans and uh, yeah, I'm happy for the questions.